Top of the morning to ya. Ay ay ay, ji sha shi fo shi he ji wo. Oh man, isn't it a, isn't it a wonderful thing? For one day in the year, we put green on and we all act like we're Irish, and we're talking silly and just being silly and frivolous. It's a if anything Patrick has given us besides green beer, right, is uh, a sense of uh, childlike wonder and awe. So at least for me, at least for me. Welcome to Good Shepherd. Fifth Sunday in Lent, hard to believe Palm Sunday is already next Sunday, but without getting ahead of ourselves. A warm welcome, especially if you're tuning in online, and especially if you might be with us for the first time. We see some friends. Love the fact that you've made our way through the door. Let's just check our stuff at the door, bring it to the altar, lay it down, put our hands out, receive word and sacrament, which is the life that we crave in a world which sometimes uh, sucks the life out of us. So on that note, let me just say a little prayer to set the scene as we enter into worship and to give thanks for St. Patrick. And to be honest with you, my mother would always say, Thomas, don't talk about Patrick and not talk about Bridget. Because my mom's name is Francis, after St. Francis, and she always drilled into me to always remember his companion, Claire. So behind every great man is an even greater woman. So Bridget and Patrick, we pray and we thank God for both of you on this day when we remember Ireland and all the Irish saints, Columba and others. But especially Patrick, as we have your icon on the altar, may it be like an icon is supposed to be, a window onto the divine. That's what an icon does. It's, you look through Patrick's icon and you see Jesus. Let us see Jesus today in word and in sacraments, in the gathering of, the, of your people as we offer up prayers and hymns of praise. We offer all of this in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Blessed be God who forgives all our sins. with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please now be seated. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke though I was then their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, 
and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Standing as you're able, we'll read Psalm 51 responsively. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. Wash me through and through from my wickedness. For I know my transgressions. Against you only have I sinned. And so you are justified when you speak. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth. For behold, you look for truth deep within me. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Make me hear of joy and gladness. Hide your face from my sins. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Cast me not away from your presence. Give me the joy of your saving help again. A reading from a letter to the Hebrews. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, and today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. Amen. Please, please take a seat. That prayer or those lyrics are found, don't need to turn to it, but that's from the hymnal. That's uh, hymn 370, which is the hymn which I got ordained to a long time ago. It's a variation on the theme of Patrick's Breastplate. I commend it to you later on when you go home Google Patrick's breastplate, and since you all have printers, just, you know, print it out. If you don't want to put, print it in color because you want to save your color ink, that's up to you. You can tell what I print my stuff out in, black and white, right? But uh, they're powerful words. Um, I bind this day to me forever the power of faith, Christ's incarnation, his baptism in the Jordan River, his death on the cross for my salvation, his bursting forth from the spiced tomb, his riding up the heavenly way, his coming at the day of doom, I bind unto myself today. little history lesson. 
There was a time in church history where there was a celebrity death match. If you've ever watched MTV, there was a little thing on there for a while. It's a bit graphic, but some of you are smiling under your breath because I'm such a Gen Xer when I say this. There was a thing on MTV where people would make out of clay uh, celebrities. Claymation, you know what I mean? I'm looking at my other Gen Xers here, maybe. Yeah, you know what I mean. And they call it Celebrity Deathmatch. And if you, if, you know, uh, if you know anything about Mortal Kombat, which is a video game, which I don't play because that's, uh, that's a lot of gore, uh, Celebrity Deathmatch is not too far behind. A lot of blood and squirting and, and heads being uh, lopped off. But anyway, uh, there was a knockdown drag out Celebrity Deathmatch in the church several centuries ago with how Christianity in the West was going to play itself out. It was decided at the Synod of Whitby. Uh, Whitby is a, is a monastic town in Northeast England. Um, I've driven by it several times. I confess I've not pulled off the highway, off the dual carriageway and gone into Whitby, W-H-I-D-B-E-Y. Uh, there's a monastery in ruins up on the cliff. There's, a, there's an abbey church, and then you go down these 99 steps like I talk, I'm talking like I've been there, but I'm such an Anglophile. I know about Whitby and I know about the 99 steps which go down to the water through the middle of town and all these beautiful little pubs and shops and yeah, maybe, maybe I'll have to hit that on this sabbatical. And um, at that big church meeting, it was decided that uh, the, Roman, the Roman Western version of Christianity was going to be the playbook for Christianity in the West, as opposed to the Celtic, the Celtic Christian playbook, which of course Patrick and Bridget and Colum Keel, which is the fancy Gaelic name for Columba. Several Anglican churches. One's a very famous one right there on the on the on the mount in uh, Northwest Washington D.C. If you've ever been to the National Cathedral, the National Cathedral is a great place to go and look around. Try to find Darth Vader in the stained glass window and the Death Star. Believe me, it's there. But also on the same cathedral grounds is a little tiny church that was there before the National Cathedral, like you know St. Luke's was there before us. So this little church called St. Columba's is a very famous Episcopal church and thriving. And so Columba came from Ireland, one of you know, the groups of Christians, Patrick and Bridget, and Columba, of course, came to the west coast of Scotland. I'm gonna test your, your church history. And of course, his abbey was on a little island called Iona. Very good, very good. So what, what, why is that a big deal that the Roman Catholic version of Christianity won out? Richard Rohr, who is a good Roman Catholic priest and Franciscan, has, I'm going to quote him here, but I agree with him wholeheartedly. Uh, he has had a bone to pick with that version of Christianity, which to the present day is still the dominant strain of Christianity. In other words, the dualistic mindset. In a nutshell, dualism is there's a right and a wrong, there's a black and a white. The non-dualistic mindset is the Celtic way, where you hold in tension the right and the wrong, the dark and the light, and not everything is black and white, so there's a gray area. Makes sense, right? Like life is not black and white. My humble opinion, unsolicited, life is not, I repeat, black and white. But isn't it true that that mindset, which we're seeing played out every day, not only in the church, but especially in our fair, fair nation, this mindset that we can't talk to the other person any longer because they feel and think a certain way that might be different from our own. Richard Rohr says that dualistic thinking is getting us in a world of hurt. I'll stop there because I want to read a quote from the little book that I recommended 
And uh, it's fine. No one yet has come up to me and said, that's a fine book you recommended, Father Tom, during Lent. I'm not going to lie to you. There's some days I'll miss three days in a row before I get back into it because, you know, we all get so busy. But this is, uh, this is worth the price of admission this morning, what Richard has to say. Again, I'm juxtaposing the Celtic way of Christianity, which Patrick espouses, called the non-dualistic mindset and the dualistic mindset, which basically we in the church are still infected from and society and the world. So Father Richard writes that dualistic is inherent, inherently, I love this, this is him talking, is inherently an argumentative Christianity. It sets us on a very limited rational way of knowing and that most of us were not told that when we needed to install software different from the either or problem solving all or nothing mind that we use to get us through the day. One of the side effects, Richard writes, of this dualistic way of seeing is that we reduce complex experiences to sets of binary alternatives. I can either focus on my career or be a family person. Or my friend and partner started this fight, so the whole thing is their fault. He continues, the two alternatives are always exclusionary usually in an angry way, and things are either totally right or totally wrong with me or against me. The binary mind provides quick security and false comfort, but never wisdom. He says we need to develop a capacity for both and thinking, that's non-dualistic thinking, so that we can embrace the complexities inherent in, it, in daily life. This involves reframing how we see our experiences while at the same time practicing being honest about what we think and feel. I'm in love with this person, he writes, but I'm angry with them right now. Or this child is behaving badly, but they're still fundamentally good. Neither my friend nor partner nor I are totally in the right or totally in the wrong. We've both played a part in this disagreement. If we don't learn to live in this non-dualistic way, we will reduce our experiences and our beliefs and our understandings to overly simplistic categories that miss much of the subtlety and complexities of life. We may think we're acting rationally when we're actually seeking to be in control. There it is for Tom Warren. Hey, it spelled my name wrong. W. A-R-N-E. We try to draw neat lines and boundaries around beautiful, expansive concepts like friendship and faith. We end up with a mindset that has, he quotes, no room for sinners or outsiders of almost any sort which was, of course, the exact opposite of Jesus' message and mission. What did Jesus say in our gospel reading today? When I am lifted up, I will draw some people to me, white people to me, gay people to me, Republicans to me, Democrats to me, Catholics to me. You get the hint. I'm a simple guy. I must be Celtic. All means all. He gets even better earlier before he says that in the gospel, and I'm going to quote from Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message. Talk about non-dualistic. I mean, Jesus was the epitome of non-dualistic thinking. Try this one on for size, because I didn't really understand it. By the way, I still have a hell of a lot of dualism in me. If you think I'm totally free of that, you got another thing coming. 
Last time I checked, I grow up and I have grown up in this country and boy, we like things to be dualistic. We like things to be right and wrong. We like things to be black and white. But I'm trying to become, and Richard Rohr is helping me become more non-dualistic in my thinking, in my being. And then when I read what I'm about to read, I'm like, there it is. How did I miss that? Jesus is the epitome of non-dualistic thinking. He was blowing the disciples' minds when he said this. He was blowing your mind when I said it, but now I'm not going to blow your mind because now you understand where Jesus is coming through from. He says in the, in the gospel we just heard Jana read, but this is the translation from the message. Jesus says, listen carefully. This is non-dualism at its best. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if, if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. I submit to you, and Richard Ward does too, if you read his daily meditation this morning on your phone, it comes out like 11.10 at night the night before, and I was getting my beauty rest on. So some of you I saw were nodding your heads, and it was beautiful. I'm not going to read what he said in, in this morning's. In, this is God, this is the Holy Spirit working on what old Father Tom was uh, germinating to say to you all this morning, but Father Richard Ward, who already was going to, and I did quote from him, he said this morning in his daily meditation, meditation, he said that what happens to a person on the inside, I'm talking now specifically about a charismatic born again experience. I'm talking to you Curcio people. So listen up. If you've been dozing, I'm talking right to you. And there's a lot of you out there and there's a lot of you listening to my voice online. Richard Rohr in this morning's meditation gave credence to what happened to you on that Holy Spirit weekend for Curcio or what happened to Tom Warren 24 years ago today on St. Patrick's Day in a Jesuit novitia in Wernersville, Pennsylvania because some little lady, and she's suffering from Alzheimer's, and I don't know if my former treasurer and the Cruckshank family from Huntington, Pennsylvania is watching, but your mother and your grandmother changed my life. She put in my, my luggage, she put Dennis Bennett's little book, nine o'clock in the morning. I can talk to you offline about what that book is all about, but I said respectfully to Lois, I said, Lois, I am not taking that book. I'm on a silent eight-day directed retreat. Ignatian, we don't talk, we're quiet. I ain't reading anything. I'm supposed to sit quietly in prayer. She said, that's gonna be very difficult for you, Tom Warren. That's why I'm sending you away with this book. Because when you're ready to pull your hair out from being silent for eight days in a row, you have a little something you can tuck into. So I tucked into that little book, nine o'clock in the morning, after the fifth day, because I was ready to go home, I had enough of being silent. I had enough of stuff that I had repressed and pushed way, 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 way down, rearing its ugly head. That's what silence does. We keep really busy. That's why I need the sabbatical. I keep really busy, and as long as I'm keeping busy, and as long as you're keeping busy, you're tamping down your trauma. You're tamping down your woundedness. You're tamping down, you're tamping it down. But I read that little book around midnight on St. Patrick's Day, 2000, 24 years ago today as I stand before you. And I had a baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is what Dennis Bennett calls it. Some of you former Baptists know all too well what I'm referring to. In other words, Tom, you had a born again experience. Indeed I did. Richard Rohr in this morning's meditation, in this daily meditation, because I'm still a dualistic thinker, the devil still wants to tell me and still wants to play a little tape deep in the recesses of my mind, heart, and soul that what happened to me 24 years ago was it didn't really happen. That that thing which happened in the middle of the night when God showed up in a powerful way, Jesus showed up in my little cell. I'm just telling you, 
He showed up in my little cell and he blessed me with a blessing that changed my life. It changed my parenting. It changed my husbanding. It changed my priesthood. It continues to reverberate. And you Curcio people know what I'm talking about. Some of you in here, were, you got the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1969 in the San Fernando Valley. And you were here this past weekend when Mother Sharon was here for the Glory to Glory conference. And I came up to you and I said, you had your Curcio 55 years ago, didn't you? And he said, yes, I did. And look at you. It was like it happened yesterday. And he said to me, yes, it is like that. Richard today said, people who have that happen to them, they don't need to hear the dualistic mindset, which says, you know, that stuff's reserved for like when Jesus walked the earth. That stuff were reserved for like the Southern Baptists or the James, uh, the Jerry Falwells or the, or the Pat Robertsons or the Oral Roberts or the Jimmy Swaggerts or here it is, the Billy Grahams. I listen to Billy Graham almost once a week on my Sirius Satellite Radio. And I commend to you that brother that brother can bring the Holy Spirit. He talks about the Holy Spirit. And Billy Graham was as successful as he was because that brother had a non-dualistic, I will argue with you to the cats come home, not the cows, I like cats better. He had a dualistic mindset. And what Patrick is saying to me to say to you, and here it is, if you're sitting there going, how come that's never happened to me? How come I never had a baptism in the Holy Spirit? How come? How come? You're asking a dualistic question. All you got to do, and it could happen right here in the quiet of your heart, you can ask God, Lord, I would like you to touch my heart and to heal me of those things which infect my heart and cloud my judgment and keep me, keep me dualistic. I submit to you, Lord, that I am sick and tired of living a dualistic spirituality. And in the spirit of Patrick, those great Celtic saints, give me your non-dualistic spirit, which is, here it is, which is the Holy Spirit. So basically the block has been until I'm telling you, I'm taking the block away from you because we're dualistic in our thinking. Pray for the dualistic mindset to go bye-bye. Step into what God would reveal to you in terms of a non-dualistic mindset. And when you start to do that, I'm telling you, your life will be transformed. If you forget everything I ever preached to you, you can take that to the bank. And if you don't believe me, talk to the bloke who made his curcio 55 years ago. You just gave yourself away, brother. It is real. And it is the lifeblood of what makes Good Shepherd real. I'll end with this. In case you're wondering, being a happy, clappy church is a non dualistic mindset. The Episcopal Church wants to put us back in a certain box. Republican Party of Prayer. You've heard that saying, right? And that's not a political statement. That's actually a, a cliche saying that I grew up with as a rector, as a, as a son of a priest, where we, and I'll, actually I'll lump in the Presbyterians with this because I'm an equal opportunity offender. Um, the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians are the Republican Party of Prayer. There are dualistic forces in the Episcopal Church which want to put Good Shepherd in that box. But here's the deal. Dennis and Rita Bennett preached from this pulpit when the Bishop of the Diocese of Olympia on the phone with the Bishop of the Diocese of California said, I'll take Dennis and Rita I've got a church up here in Ballard, St. Luke's today, St. Luke's Ballard, and I'll get them out of your hair. What happened was, and it's in the book, it's on the bookshelf in the library, nine o'clock in the morning. What happened to Dennis Bennett 
He was a good dualistic Episcopal priest like I used to be, and he was in a prayer group at a prisoner's house, and they had dinner, and they had some wine, and they had a nice time, and they're ready to say goodbye, and the lay people like you guys, you're the problem. <laughs> the lay people said, we want to pray for you and your wife before you leave, Dennis. Dennis, you know, being a good dualistic rector says, ah, we're fine. I'm sure I've said that to prisoners. I want to pray with you, Father. Ah, uh, you're, you're good. We're fine. I don't do that anymore. You, want to, you pray for me, I'm, I'm on my knees. I'm going for it. So uh, they circle around Dennis and Rita Bennett, and uh, the lay people start praying over him. And uh, like some of you have, like I just described, the Holy Spirit came on him in such a powerful way. And uh, he got home and he said to Rita, what do, I do? what do I do with this? See, that's a dualistic mind saying, what, do you, what you do with that is it never happened. That was, that was poppycock. Don't worry about it. That's, we, need, we have a parish to run, for God's sakes. St. Mark's in Van Nuys, California. He said, I can't shake this. I need to tell the parishioners what happened to me. It's the godly non-dualistic. He didn't say non-dualistic, but it's the godly thing to do. She knew. Rector's wives, they know. You drop that bomb on a congregation, half the congregation is going to get up and walk out, and they're going to have the bishop on speed dial before the Methodists get to the diner. And that's exactly what happened. He preached from the pulpit of St. Mark's Church, Episcopal Church in Van Nuys, California, that he had, like I told you what happened to me 24 years ago, that he had a baptism of the Holy Spirit and it changed his life. And half the congregation got up and walked out. And his senior warden was on the phone to the Bishop of the Diocese of California that afternoon and said, Houston, we have a problem. So that good bishop, because that's how they used to do back then, I don't know if they still do it today, he picked up the phone, he called his buddy Stephen Bain, long dead, late great Bishop of the Diocese of Olympia, and he said, Stephen, I got a hot one here. Can you help me out? And Stephen Bain said, I have a little podunk church in Ballard. Ballard back then was nothing compared to what it is today. Now it's brew pubs, and, and actually that church, St. Luke's, had just struck a big deal with the diocese, and uh, Ron Miller, who's out there keeping an eye on things, he's on the board of directors for the diocese, and they're doing a great thing there because they got a great rector, she's a great woman, and they just struck a deal with the city of Seattle, and so they are going to tear down the church because they own a city block, and they're gonna allow affordable housing on that block in Seattle and Ballard, seven stories high, to go up. That's non-dualistic thinking. That's the kind of, so anyway, he said, yeah, you can just tuck him in there in Ballard. And then to tie this story off, I'm pretty sure, and correct me, I'm, I'm, I'm always open for correction, but this is a, a little church of, the good, church of the Good Shepherd history lesson here because it all is six degrees of separation, right? Um, so Dennis Bennett and Rita are up there in Ballard. They're doing Wednesday night uh, revival services. You know, some of you remember the charismatic uh, revival uh, in the Episcopal Church in the early 70s, and he's up there doing uh, Wednesday night, standing room only. People are falling out in the spirit. People are speaking in tongues. Very Pentecostal, very charismatic, very, co very kosher, very, very, very non-dualistic, according to Richard Rohr. And there was a guy who was happened to be a grocer with his young family. This guy's name is Bob Rhodes. And so Bob Rhodes went to this Wednesday night revival service in St. Luke's and Ballard. And Bob Rhodes, I should let him tell this story. Something happened to Bob Rhodes when he went to those, those revival meetings on a Wednesday night when he was a young businessman and family man living up in Seattle at the time. Some of you are sitting here going, who the heck is Bob Rhodes? So that, that grocer, that man, Bob Rhodes, because of what happened to him up there and the power of the Holy Spirit, he came home and he told Rita, and her ashes are in the columbarium in the back of the church. He told Rita, I want to be a priest. We're going to seminary. She said, let's do it. They went to, Cal they went to Church Divinity School of the Pacific down in Berkeley, California. He got ordained, and fast forward, the Bishop of Olympia made him... Not the first rector, that was Sumner Walters. He was a St. Luke's guy, and he was up here kind of holding down the fort. But in 1974, 
uh, Bob Rhodes, the Reverend Bob Rhodes, became, for all intents and purposes, and he argues with me on this because I call him the first rector. He says, I wasn't the first. He was, in my humble opinion, the first rector of this incredible Episcopal church that we find ourselves in. So now you're connecting the dots. When I had almost two years of not finding work, I mean, I had work. I was a small town priest in a small church, but it was time for me to move on. And I was not getting any nibbles. I, that lure I threw in the water was just bobbing up and down, and it did not, you know, go under. And now you are connecting the dots. God, in God's infinite wisdom, took a kid like me who never had a church this size who never had a staff, who never had more than 50 people on a Sunday, who never had more than a $75,000 budget, et cetera, et cetera. God and God's Holy Spirit connected me 3,000 miles away with the people on the search committee, and some of you are sitting here right now listening to my voice, and God just connected the history of this church, which I just explained to you through Dennis, Rita, Bob, and the Holy Spirit, and then Tom Warren, of course, this was after I had my baptism of the Holy Spirit in 2000, 24 years ago, and God did this. Lock and load. Thanks be to God, right? That's a true story. And he, the good Lord, continues to take all of us from strength to strength as long as we're keeping our eyes on Jesus. Patrick and Celtic Christianity continue to bless and inform me, and then Richard Rohr is a new Celtic saint. I mean, when that guy dies, he's definitely going to be on the saint's calendar. And so if you haven't, if you haven't gotten this book, it's okay. I don't really care, but it's a really gentle entree into what I talked about today. And if you're over 50, because I've given about 10 copies out, I usually have them on my shelf, and I don't have them anymore because people don't ever return their books, and that's fine. But if you're over 50 and you haven't read anything worthwhile in a long time, and if something I said today strikes your fancy, from my money, Richard's magnum opus is his book called Falling Upward spirituality for the second half of life. And I'm looking around here, except for my fair-weathered acolytes. All of us, most of us are in our second half of life and his book, Falling Upward, it's only about that thick. You know, I don't read books that are more than that thick. These, these, um, it will bless you mightily. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the reminder of how you have worked over the years in all of us. I thank you for reminding folk who have made their curseo of that moment when you touched their hearts. I thank you for reminding myself of that moment 24 years ago when my heart, as John Wesley said in the Anglican church near Trafalgar Square, when he was sitting and listening to the epistle to the Romans being read, Wesley, a good Anglican priest at the time, said, my heart was strangely warmed. If hearts have been strangely warmed today by the preaching of your word, I pray, Lord, you would continue to bless and to grow that tingling, to grow that warmth that you have already now created in them. Let them move towards you in a non-dualistic way and in their relationships, and let them see that the Celtic way of Christianity is still alive and well, and especially this day when we remember your servant, Patrick, Bridget, and Columba. I pray in your precious name, Lord Jesus, amen. Let us now stand, and I know that Darlene is going to lead you to say out loud, extemporaneously, those prayers of the people that you would like to share. So standing as you're able, I'll have Darlene come up and lead us in that.
For prayers of the people, please say your prayers out loud. For this congregation, I pray that God is with us, heals us, guides us, and takes care of us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. prayer. Pray for all those who are sick, fighting cancer, battling addiction, those who suffer from any kind of mental illness, uh, caregivers, docs, nurses, paramedics on the front line, cops, firefighters. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our, Hear our prayer. Thank you for the sunshine. Amen. Yes, thank you for the daffodils and the lilacs and the crocuses, the breeze, the, the birds chirping violently, or that's not the best word. <laughs> Energetically, thank you. Energetically. And uh, on a personal note, I think my wife has already posted it because she does the social media and I don't, but we have a little hummingbird mother who created a nest right outside our window. And uh, it is quite stunning to be in awe of God's creation to see this tiny, tiny little mom flying back and forth to her tiny, tiny little nest. And just to sit there and sit there to bring forth new life. It's really beautiful. I thank you, Lord, for that gift. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pray. This pray is for Donald Trump, who faces unlimited injustice and hatred by the Democratic Party. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We do pray for Frank Lopez and the repose of his soul. We commended his soul to Almighty God yesterday during the funeral here. But we also take a moment to pray for all those who have died, either in the silent of our hearts or out loud. For my grandparents. For all the saints of Good Shepherd that have been interred in our columbarium in the back of the church, and outside, God rest their souls and may light perpetual shine upon them and all the faithful departed who rest now in your peace. Amen. Amen. Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways 
to the glory of your name. Amen. Mighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Standing now as you may be able, the peace of the Lord be always with you. So let me offer a, a scribe to the Lord, the honor to his name, bring offerings now, and come into his courts. Do you want to give a little introduction, or it doesn't need one?
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation, who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. by water and the Spirit. Now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night before he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of our mothers, God of Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. 
Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayer and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great High Priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your Church, gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. This is God's table. All are welcome here and there is gluten-free or non-alcoholic options. Just let us know.
Bow down before the Lord. Look mercifully on this your family, Almighty God, that by your great goodness they may be governed and preserved evermore through Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah, we have really uh, a bunch of sign-ups that need your attention. They're there in the bulletin insert, but uh, let me just check with Phil because Phil's here. How many words, how many seven last words of Christ are we? Two, and we can handle four if we got four. Okay, so anywhere from two to four, seven last words of Christ from the cross on Good Friday. Phil's in the back. Raise your hand. There's Phil. Please pray about that. And if you can't give him an answer today, uh, you have his, uh, right there is his email and his phone number. You can call him during the week. But let's try to get folks signed up for that wonderful thing. Like I said, Palm Sunday's next week, and uh, we've been so busy, and I've not hyped it, but we have a ton of parts for the Passion Gospel that need picked up today, signed up for, and then you come back next week, and you're a Pontius Pilate or you're a chief priest. You know how that works. That's next, that's next Sunday, ladies and gentlemen, Palm Sunday. Please grab a script in the back on the shelf, sign up. Sign up for the prayer vigil. That's the all-night prayer vigil that Chuck over in the corner. Make sure that everybody's uh, looked after from uh, the last part of the uh, of Monday, Thursday, all the way to noon on Good Friday. And uh, Diane Lingholm, she would have me if I don't let you know about the agape meal before the foot washing ceremony and the and the proper liturgy for Monday, Thursday. There's signups there that are needed for the famous uh, uh, agape meal, so they know how many people to prepare food for. So again, sign up for Palm Sunday, sign up for prayer vigil, sign up for the agape meal, see Phil for the seven last words, and then when you're done with that, enjoy the beautiful spring-like weather. And this Thursday night is at right. final, final Draft uh, Brewing, just a couple of blocks from here, is our Theology Pub. That's right. 6.30. Y'all, we are talking about temptation. Yes, Isn't that good for Lent? That, that, that's, uh, I think that suggestion came from Brian Goforth, and he may have been kidding. Uh, but, but, but it promises to be a great discussion. What do you believe about temptation? What do you believe about a tempter? Ooh. And, so. and today at 2.30, if you like the violins that Riley and... Uh, Joel, it's at 3. There's a violin uh, concert free of charge today at 3. I know it's hard for you Northwesterners, which I'm included, to come back to church when the weather's like this. But if you like your violin, uh, it's a free concert here today. And also uh, his wife and her voice students are going to be singing a recital uh, next Sunday. And last but not least, speaking of next Sunday, I'll be at West Point. I'll be in the cadet chapel with our son, Eli. Uh, Jan is going to hold down the fort. That means she's also stepping into the prayer walk between services that children and adults are allowed, of course, to be at. So uh, I'll be thinking of you from the cadet chapel, and I'm bringing that young boy of mine back home for Holy Week. Nice. He's like, uh, but all my friends are going to Fort Lauderdale, Dad, for spring break. <laughs> I, said, I said, welcome to being a preacher's kid. Spring break is Holy Week at the church. <laughs> so... So we'll be back, uh, we'll be, I'll be back in the pocket on Wednesday of Holy Week. Jan is preaching Thursday, Friday, and she's doing the vigil. I'm preaching uh, Easter Sunday, and then I'm flying out April 2nd. So your sermons will be average of 15 minutes from now until July 21st. <laughs> <laughs> hey, by the way, is this somebody's? Is that somebody's? That's been plugged in there for a while. Just saying, I'll leave it plugged in. On your honor, I know it's a brand new Apple phone charger, but someone definitely left it here, so we'll leave it there for right now. You were going to say something? No, someone was going to say something? It was me. So I am still looking for more images for the creation reading for the vigil, and those will come up on the, uh, on the screens at the vigil when we are hearing that reading from Genesis. And it's a dark room, candle lit, and then the imagery, and I think that will be beautiful. Yes. So take a few minutes, go through your camera roll, because I don't want to be using stock images more than I have to, and I also don't want to be stealing. So I would like permission, images from people who took their own pictures and give me permission to use them for them. Mm -hmm. That would be nice. Okay. Take it away, Joel.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.